This is the Building Automation Monthly Podcast with Phil Zito, Episode 70. Hey folks, Phil Zito here, and welcome to Episode 70 of the Building Automation Monthly Podcast. And in this episode, I will be taking you through what are mechanical, electrical, and plumbing plans, otherwise known as MEP plans. Now, you can find everything I mentioned from today's episode at buildingautomationmonthly.com forward slash 70. Once again, that is buildingautomationmonthly.com forward slash 70. Now, continuing with the new structure that I set up last episode, we're going to start off with my technical tip. Now, here is my tip for you, and this is going to be an interesting one, but it's one that I found a lot of folks use. And back when I was starting off in building automation, I really didn't understand the impact of this tip. You know, I I knew a lot of practical knowledge, or I wouldn't even say practical. I knew a lot of textbook knowledge, but I didn't understand the practical impact of this. And so the tip today is when to use DC sensors versus milliamp sensors. You know, there's really three things as to when you would use a DC sensor and when you would use a milliamp sensor. And the way I like to explain this is kind of thinking of, you know, the DC sensor is kind of the everyman sensor for most scenarios it's going to be just fine. You know, it's going to go and let's say you want to get humidity and you want to pull humidity off of a humidity sensor. And you want 0 to 100% humidity and you got a 0 to 10 volt DC sensor coming off the wall. You're going to be solid. But there are some instances where you would want to use a milliamp sensor. And really, what is the difference between milliamp and DC? Well, DC is voltage, okay? Whereas milliamp is current. And see, current is based on voltage times resistance, whereas voltage is not based on that equation. Now, why does that even matter to you? Well, it matters for one really important point. When you start to go further than, you know, in some people would say 50 feet, some people would say 100, some people would say 200. You know, it just depends really on a lot of conditions. But, you know, the average thing is when you go more than about 100 feet, your voltage will start to do what's called dropping. And, you know, at first it's not really that big of a deal. You lose a little bit. Yeah, okay, maybe your sensor is a little bit off. But when you start to have large voltage drops, then you can start to see inaccuracies in what you're measuring. Now, what would this look like? Let's say you are doing a zero to 10 volts DC sensor for your humidity. And basically, you know, each volt equals 10% humidity. Well, if you drop half a volt, you drop 5% humidity. That may be just enough to kick on a humidifier or to kick on a dehumidification sequence. So in that case, if you are having long runs, you would want to use a current sensor because milliamps, you're not going to have that voltage drop. So that's one reason why. Another reason why is if you want to have what's called a true zero. The really cool thing about 4 to 20 milliamp sensors is that anything below 4 milliamps is going to start giving you a negative value. So you have a true, what's called a true zero and what that means is that if there is an issue with the sensor it's not just going to say zero like you are seeing with um with a dc sensor it's going to show something else like maybe negative 25 if you're doing a zero to 100 percent range so that is why you would want to use milliamps for that and finally, the other one is that if you really, really want to just eliminate any potential, I don't want to say wiring, but, but kind of polarity issues. And polarity basically just means like 
what is the positive and what is the negative. So if you've looked at a battery, right, and you see positive and negative, and you try to install that battery backwards, which I've been guilty of a couple times, you know that things don't work. Well, with sensors, it's kind of the same way. If you get your positive and negative, especially with DC sensors, uh, mixed up, then you could get a bad value. Well, with current, you don't really have to worry about that as much. It's just that you're going to get a current value. And with DC sensors, you got to worry about your positive and your negative and make sure that those wires aren't crossed. So those are the three reasons why you would potentially want to use a 4 to 20 milliamp sensor. All right, so let's dive into today's topic, which is MEP plans. You know, I was really uber fortunate when I came into the building automation world in that I came out of the US Navy and there's one thing that the Navy is really good at teaching you and it's reading diagrams. I mean, I probably spent half my time when I was in the Navy either learning to read diagrams or reading diagrams. The other half was probably spent sweeping because uh, they like to do a lot of sweeping and a lot of painting, a ridiculous amount of painting to the point that I like get shivers when I see paintbrushes they just like oh, oh my gosh they just do not make me happy <laughs> no more painting anyways back what i was saying so it just gave me the blessing of being really good at reading you know mechanical just drawings in general and and pulling through that information but i realize that for a lot of folks coming into the building automation space if you aren't coming in with a construction background, if you aren't coming in with an HVAC background, then you may not know what mechanical plans are. You may not know what MEP plans are. And so really what I wanted to do in this episode was just unpack what MEP plans are. Basically what they are, they stand for mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. What they are, are they are the blueprints. They are the map of how a building is going to be built or how a building was built. Because realize that you're going to encounter these things in two kind of scenarios, right? You're, one scenario is you're installing a building automation system and you're encountering drawings as part of a construction project. The other is you're out trying to troubleshoot or service a building automation system and you're encountering drawings as part of a service opportunity and they're existing drawings. So whenever you look at drawings, though, it doesn't matter whether they are existing or current drawings. There's three main areas that you want to focus in on. And if you focus in on these three, three areas that I'm going to give you here, then you will be ahead of the curve. You'll really be able to kind of narrow down what you need to know from these drawings because these drawings could be pretty powerful between mechanical drawings and specifications. If you can master those two things, then you will find yourself being able to really just walk into a job site or walk onto a construction project and immediately know what's going on, what's there, what should be functioning, how should it be functioning, where should it be? I mean, that is an awesome power to have, you know, to, to actually go and walk into the job trailer. And normally they have the drawings like sitting up on this kind of slanted easel board and, you know, it's normally made of like pegboard and it's sitting there and the drawings are bound up and you open them up and you flip to the mechanical section. And there you go. You can start immediately diving in and knowing exactly what's going on. And that is just it's really powerful because whether they like to admit it or not, there's a lot of people in our industry who don't have that skill. I mean, it's freaking scary that they don't have that skill when you really think about what they're doing, but it's kind of, it's just is what it is, I guess. So let's dive into the three kinds of drawings that you would expect to see. And they are schedules, floor plans, and details. So let's dive into what a schedule is. Now schedule 
is not what you would think it is, right? So you hear the word schedule, and if you're like me, the first time you heard, oh, go look at the equipment schedule, I was like, what, when the equipment's supposed to show up? I'm like, what does that have to do with anything, you know? I mean, okay, that's great. I'll go find out when the equipment's supposed to show up. And uh, fortunately, I didn't say that because I probably would have sounded pretty stupid. But um, what it was is the equipment schedule is simply a list of how the equipment is supposed to perform, is is designed. So, you know, a common example would be what's called a terminal unit schedule. And a terminal unit schedule will typically list out all of the VAV boxes, also known as terminal units, and it'll list all those out, and it'll list out like the duct size, the CFM, if there's a fan, if there's a coil, you know, the entering and leaving, the 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 gain or the rise and the drop across the coil, those kind of things. All those little concepts that are really important for you as a controls contractor to understand that way you can make sure that systems are performing the way they should be performing. And so as you you start to look through these schedules, you're able to then determine, you know, how many pumps are there? What kind of tonnage is there? What kind of system is this? And once you understand that information, it really makes it it just gives you this power to be able to understand how it should be performing. And this is especially true from a troubleshooting and service perspective. Like if you know all these terminal units have reheat, but yet all of them are for some reason not heating, even though they're commanded on, that really helps you narrow down a couple different scenarios that could be happening. You know, maybe you've got the hot water system shut down, or maybe a pump's failed, or maybe there's some sort of setting, some warmer or summer winter changeover setting in the box that's keeping it from enabling heat. There could be a variety of things going on, but if you don't know what's in those units, what's in those boxes, then you won't know how to begin troubleshooting. So the schedule drawing is really powerful and you're really going to want to know that following that is the floor plan and the floor plan i mean we've all seen floor plans right i mean i'm sure you have walked to a stairwell and seen a map of a floor saying you are here or looked at a floor plan in a mall i mean does anyone even go to malls anymore i don't know i shop on amazon all the time so i have no idea uh, I can't, I honestly cannot remember the last time I was in a mall. I think this is pretty sad. I think it was probably four years ago. Holy sh Nikes. Wow. That's crazy. Anyways. Um, wow. So floor plans, floor plans lay out how the floor is supposed to be. And your main focus here is the mechanical and the plumbing and the electrical floor plans. Each one of these is going to tell you something a little different. So the mechanical floor plans, they're going to help you nail down where diffusers are. And diffusers are just another way of saying the ducts that diffuse air. They're basically like, I've got a quote, quote, supply duct. So it's coming from my unit that's in my house sitting above my head blowing cold air that is a diffuser but then you have exhaust diffusers as well so it's kind of confusing because like diffuser you think it like diffuse it would go and shoot stuff out of it but then i'm calling it an exhaust diffuser i guess in that case you could call it an exhaust grill or an exhaust duct but anyways belaboring the point of naming uh skip naming standards which don't really matter the important point is that it lays out where the air comes out where the air goes back the mechanical plans going to lay out where your sensors are located you know how the the duct works run all sorts of really important things where vav boxes are and accurate mechanical drawings can just make your life so much easier there's nothing worse 
than going to a job site to do a service call and poking your head up. See, ceiling tile hates me for some reason for as long as I've been in this field and as many ceilings as I've been in, I just for the life of me cannot work with ceiling tile. I don't, I don't know what it is, but like some people seem to have the Midas touch. They touch the ceiling tile, it pops out nicely, just goes perfectly, and then they just put it back in. Me, it's like raining freaking dust, and it's like breaking in half. I don't know if it's because I was a wrestler, and I kind of don't really have the gentle fingers and hands. I have no idea, but, but they don't like me none, nonetheless. So for me... A V a V box that is exactly where it says it's going to be on the mechanical drawings is like, oh my gosh, you've just made me so happy. Because <laughs> then I'm not, you know, Conan the the ceiling tile destroyer <laughs> going and just breaking stuff. But in all seriousness, mechanical drawings, electrical drawings, controls, or sorry, yeah, like controls drawings, no, plumbing drawings. They're all going to show you some valuable stuff. So mechanical ones, they're going to show you all that stuff I just described. Plumbing is going to show you where piping's at, where pumps are at, those kind of things. How many GPMs, the size of valves. Really, really helpful stuff, especially if you're working with either install or service. And then finally, electrical is going to show you where your transformers are, where your voltage is coming from, where panels are in case you happen to blow a transformer or blow a circuit, all that information. It's going to be really, really powerful. Now, the last type of drawing that I will discuss is known as details. And this is where you notice the difference between a new building automation professional and a, a seasoned building automation professional. A new building automation professional will look at the mechanical drawings, the floor plans, will look at the schedules, but they won't look at the details. And the details can really haunt you because it's in the details that you'll find things like dampers to be installed by equipment manufacturer to be controlled by DDC, um, contractor or you may see something like pump to be coordinated or pump control to be coordinated between electrical contractor and DDC contractor and you know it's these little minor details or you may see like um, you know bypass damper eliminated uh, VFD to be added by controls contractor and if you don't catch these little details whether you're in sales whether you're on install, whether you're in service, not catching these details can really impact your success. I mean, imagine you're a salesperson and you're going and you're pricing up a job. And what you didn't realize is that on this package rooftop unit, and I like to use this example because I've just seen it happen so many times. And it is so ridiculously stupid that this happens, but I'm not here to debate how dumb this is. Just know that folks who are doing this, you're making stupid choices. But anyways, uh, it's when folks buy a packaged unit, like a packaged rooftop or a packaged AHU, where all the controls are being controlled by a microprocessor board that sits inside the unit. And then you get this engineer that comes along and they're like, well, actuators and and." dampers and all that they're going to be installed by the equipment manufacturer but the controls manufacturer is going to go and control the dampers and then you get the the unit it comes in it's got the back net card on it you're like yeah it actually got a back net card they didn't buy a lawn card or some sort of other protocol they actually bought the right one so you're like super excited and then you go and you pull it in and and it's like, oh, and they even bought all the right modules, so you're able to pull in the points, and you're like, this is going to be the easiest controls job ever. And then you get this commissioning agent that comes on, and he's like, so where's your controller to control the dampers? And you're like, um, well, it's a smart equipment with a control board, and it's controlling the dampers. Well, it says in the details 
that you're going to control the dampers. And you're like, well, that makes no freaking sense. I know what it says, but it's a controller that's doing everything. And if it's not controlling the dampers, there's probably other sequences inside it that it's not going to be aware of. And it's going to break everything. Like, what if it's got a freeze or a low temp control or, or a warm up or something? And no, no, I don't care about that logic. It says you're supposed to control the dampers. So you're going to disconnect the wires from that control panel and you're going to hook your controller up to control those dampers. Well, yeah, but it's going to, it doesn't matter what it's going to do. You got to do that or I'm going to hold your retainer until you do it. And by the way, there's liquidated damages on the job. So every day that you argue with me is I'm going to charge your controls company because you aren't doing what the drawings say. And it's like, are you freaking serious, dude? Like you do understand how all this stuff works. I don't care how it works. You got to do what's on the drawings. And it's like back and forth. And you're just like ready to shoot yourself you're like, oh my gosh, this is so asinine. I can't believe I'm having to do this. And then you go and you you try to run it up the contracting tier and they're like, well, if, if, if you had had an issue with it, you should have submitted an RFC, a request for clarification, or, or an RFI, a request for information. Uh, you should have submitted that back before the stuff was installed because now we're in closeout and it's too late. And you're like, really? So we're going to go and we're going to rip the wires off of this perfectly good control board and hook them up to my controller, which is going to have no other sensing because I'm not going to include sensors for anything. And and we're going to control the dampers and we're going to hand this over to the customer. Yep. You're like, okay, I guess if that's what you want to do. And then, you know, six months later, the customer's like cursing you out. Why in the world would you do that? Well, because the drawings said I... Well, why didn't, and so long story short, make sure you pay attention to the details. Cause I mean, I've literally had those kind of conversations where it's just like, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, some of the stuff you see, I, I was talking to this one architect the other day and I was joking about how I saw a BIM model where the uh, mechanical, no, the, uh, the plumbing guy cut what was it? No, it was the mechanical cut through the pipe because on the BIM model, and BIM model is like a 3D model that shows where everything's supposed to be. And uh, basically he cut through the pipe to run his ductwork because on the BIM model, it showed his ductwork going through the pipe. And he's like, no, 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 Phil. I've got a better one. I was like, really? I was like, how do you get better than that? He said, the sprinkler the guy who's running all the sprinkler pipes actually drilled holes in the ductwork and put the sprinkler pipes through the ductwork. I, like, I mean, think about that for a second. What is going through your mind? Cause like, it's not laziness cause you actually have to do more work to drill through the ductwork and put sprinkler pipes through. So, I mean, what is going through someone's mind when they're like, well, I see the drawings, and they say that sprinkler pipe should be going right through that ductwork. So I'm going to go right through it. And it's like, are you sure? Maybe we should go. No, nope. drawings always right. And so, so long. Anyways, I don't know where I was going with that. But the point is, is you got to pay attention to this stuff, but you also can't just blindly follow it you know if you notice something that is just goofy something that makes no sense like actuators and dampers being controlled on a unit that already has a control board on it uh then you might uh, i'm not even gonna say might you should say something run it up the chain submit you know a request for clarification submit an rfi whatever they call it in your uh, contracting team submit that information request and find out what exactly is supposed to be going on so there you have it and uh for those of you 
who are more readers and would like to see some examples of this, I wrote up an article about this exact topic. And you can go and check that out by going to buildingautomationmonthly.com forward slash 70. And I will link to that article at the bottom of the podcast show notes. And with that being said, that's it for today's podcast episode. And I would really, really love it if you would give me some feedback. Just drop into Building Automation monthly.com forward slash 70 let me know what your experience has been with controls drawings maybe you've got a crazy story maybe you've seen folks uh run duct work through rooftop units or something crazy like that i would love to hear your story in the comments section and until next time remember to just keep pushing on keep learning keep getting better every day day by day, and I'll talk to you later. Take care.